Hello and welcome to the 2D platformer tutorial. We're going to be learning how to make a 2D character controller as well as a couple of other fundamentals in making a 2D platformer. Okay, so first things first, all the assets that I'm going to be using are available for download here at kenny.nl. So Kenny is a site where you can get free art assets. These are found in the 2D section or you just enter this URL here, assets slash simplified platformer pack. We'll put a link in the description as well. So you can come over here and hit download. It'll give you an archive and then you can go ahead and throw that in a folder here in your Unity project. So in my project, I have a separate folder for example assets and then another folder in there for Kenny. And then I have one for this simplified platformer pack. Once you have that imported, you'll see that there's a few folders that it comes with. There's the PNG, tile sheet, and vector. And that's because there's multiple ways that you can set up your 2D assets in a Unity project. So the first and most obvious one is that you have these PNGs. So you can see that if I go over to the character, there's just separate images for each of the frame of the character animation. And on the items, there's just separate images for each of the items. And for the tiles, so the world actually is made up of all these separate tiles as well. So these are just separate files, okay? For spikes, doors, buttons, etc. Now, the other way is that you have tile sheets. So tile sheets are single image files that have many images inside of them. So for example, the character controller, you can see here is one image file, but it has several images in it. You can see this idle, jump, and then these walking animation frames, they're all squeezed into one image file. Now this is a really common technique and Unity comes with tools to chop these images up that lets you select each of these frames individually. And same thing with this one here. This is also just one image file that has a bunch of separate images inside of it. You can see that each of these is a different tile that you would have found in the PNG for the same name. Right, so you have all those. So today, we're gonna get up and running with the simplest method. So for our character, we're gonna be using these PNGs, and the one that we wanna start with is this idle image. Now, what I'm gonna do is first select all of these. Okay, so I can select the first one, holding shift, select the last one, now all of them are selected. I'm gonna come over here to texture type, and go to sprite, 2D, and UI. Okay, and then after I do that, I'm gonna come down here to apply. So now all of these are being read as sprites that we can use. So I could take this idle image and drag it into my hierarchy. Okay, and it's called platform character idle. So what I'll do is call this our player sprite. Now with this selected in the hierarchy, I'm gonna go ahead and hit this 2D button on my scene view. Make sure I have this player sprite game object selected. Put my mouse over here in the scene view and hit F. That focuses in on my player sprite. And then what I wanna do is drag and drop my player sprite into the project view so I can create a prefab of it. So now you can see up here, it's blue. That means it's prefab. And we're gonna continue working on it inside the prefab. So I'm gonna double click the asset. And now you can see that we're in, we're in the prefab up here because you can see this is no longer the scene hierarchy that we are now inside of the prefab. So first thing I wanna do is add a component and we're gonna say 2D Capsule Collider. You can see that it looks like it added a circle, but that's just because it tried adding a capsule collider around essentially a perfect square in here. So if we hit this little button next to Edit Collider, you can see that it gives us these four points on the circle and that in fact, this is a capsule. So if I bring that into the edge of that and that, bring this down like that, maybe a little bit higher, something like that. So this is gonna be the collider that interacts with the world in the game. We're not gonna be able to see it, right? If I click off, you can't really see it, but you can just imagine that when we're running around and when we're bumping into things that this is going to be the shape Unity uses to detect those collisions. Okay, then we're gonna come here and add component, type in rigid body 2D. Okay, and we'll leave that as is for now. Now, to give this little guy a test, I'm gonna go ahead and make sure that I save it. Personally, I have autosave off right now, uh, but you can check it to make sure that 
all the changes that you're making to your prefab save before you exit the prefab viewing mode. But if you do have it unchecked, remember to hit this little save button or to hit control S or this button here. Okay, so I'm gonna go back out to the main scene and I'm gonna come over to our tiles. This isn't really a tutorial on how to do all of the tile sheets. So I'm just gonna show you a quick and dirty way of how to get some of these world elements set up as separate images. So I'm gonna go ahead and select this first tile up here, come all the way down, holding shift, I'm gonna select the last one. And we're gonna do the same thing here that we did with the other set of PNGs, which is to change the texture type to Sprite 2D and UI. And don't forget to hit apply here. So I'm gonna take this first one and I'm gonna drag it into the scene. Okay, and if I zoom out a little bit, I'm gonna go ahead and scooch it down like that. Now, you might be tempted to just scale this out or to use this tool to also change its scale on individual axes like that. But what I'm gonna do is keep all the scales here at one, right? So our little tile here is set to one, one, one. I'm gonna change this to tiled. I'm just gonna adjust this so it matches a little bit better like that. Okay, and I could adjust the width now so it can extend a little longer. And you'll see that the tile's now looping. Okay, then I'm gonna go ahead and add a component. Okay, and I'm just gonna add this box collider 2D. I'm gonna hit the edit button and I'm just gonna go ahead and stretch this out to meet the dimensions of this. Okay, again, this is just a quick and dirty way to get set up with our character controller. Okay, so now if I hit play, you see our character controller drops onto here and stops right at the platform. So if I select this player and pick him up and drop him, always land safely. And if I select this, I can move it and it always kind of keeps our little guy there. You can bounce him up and down. Let's add some movement to our character controller. I'm going to select his prefab, go into the prefab, select him, and we're gonna add a FSM, and we're gonna call this move. Hit edit, open up this FSM, I'm gonna move my actions right here, squeeze this in a little bit, and call this first date init. Might wanna put something here later, but I'm gonna add a finish transition and a new state here. So in this first state, we're gonna call it idle. Now in idle, we're going to put in some actions. We're going to do a get key down. Okay, so this is going to be the quick and dirty version of player movement. Now if you're using another input system like Unity's new input system or third party assets like Rewired, there are equivalent actions for you that are equivalent to these. They have the get, get down, and get up. So similarly we have get button, get button down, get button up. If you wanted to use input axes, Unity's legacy input. Uh, for simplicity's sake, we're gonna be using get key down. So get key down, we're gonna have a left arrow and I'm gonna do a right arrow. Okay, or you could do A and D, whatever you want. You can even put all four here. So if you wanted, you could do this. Also, when you're scrolling through input lists like this, you could type in the first letter of whatever the key is. So for example, A, I could just hit A. It'll go through the alphas first, but eventually it'll take me to the letter A. Okay, And then same thing with right arrow. Uh, same thing with D. I can hit D here. It takes me to D. Okay, so what I want these actions to send off to is a state that we can call left and one called right. Okay, so from idle, we'll have the left arrow send a new event called left. And instead of adding the transition here, what I'm gonna do is right click on the left state and add a global transition left. And that'll keep things a little cleaner over here. Okay, and same thing with right, we're gonna do that. So if I go to idle and for the right arrow, I'm gonna send a new event called right. Right click on the right state, add global transition, right. Now, uh, we do the same thing with A and D. So A would be going to the left and D would be going to the right. Now in the left state, what we could do is put a set velocity 2D action in here. Okay, and it's gonna be setting the player sprite 
the x velocity, that means left and right, it's going to be setting the velocity only on that x-axis. So we can use a variable, we'll make a new variable called player speed. Okay, now right now by default it's zero because if we come over to our variables tab and select player speed, the default value for a float is going to be zero. So you can hand enter it here. We'll say that the default speed, let's just say three. Okay, now you can see three right here. Now in our left state, we're going to get a get key up. Okay, and we're going to put that right after this. So the get, so the key that we want to get here is going to be the left arrow again. And a, we also want the A arrow, right? So I'm going to do A as well. Okay. And the event that it's going to send will be a new event, idle. Okay. And same thing here, idle. And I'm going to move this init state up and we'll right click on idle, add global transition, idle. Okay. So it's just going to send back and forth like that. So once we let go of the key, when the key goes up, it'll send back to this idle state. Now, I don't know what happened here, but I'm just gonna go ahead and change this vector to none by hitting this button here. Okay, just so it's only listening to this. And I'm gonna copy all of these actions. So if I select the first one, hold shift and select the last one, I can control C or command C if you're on a Mac to copy them, or you can just go like this, copy selected actions, come over to the right state, paste them in here. And instead of left arrow, we're gonna do right arrow and instead of a we're going to do d okay so when we let go of the right arrow or the d or the d key it's going to send back to idle okay now the thing is that this player speed is the same for both left and right so when we hit left or right it's going to set the x velocity to three which like i said is always going to be to the right since it's a positive value we want to make sure that when we move to the left it's a negative value so actually a, maybe a better name for this instead of player speed we can come over to variables select this and call it move left and we'll have this set to negative one and we'll have another float called move right which will be set to positive one okay so you have a negative one and a positive one move left and move right so on our left we could use move left which is negative one and on right we could use move right which is positive one and the reason we want to use variables for this is so if you ever wanted to add a run feature you can just add a multiplier to each of these on the states. That way they could change independently. Because if you didn't use a variable, say if you just hard coded it in like this, you're not gonna be able to change this value at runtime. So there's no speed boost or run button or anything like that. Okay, so if we have this to move left, we'll be able to change it later dynamically. All right, now before we run this, let's just make sure that our set velocities are checked for every frame, okay? That way they stay running as long as we're in the state. Now let's go back to the scene and hit play. Okay, now the thing that you'll already notice <laughs> is our little guy's kind of rolling over. Uh, and that's because if you uh, select him, it's he's that little pill shape, right? So he's kind of rolling around. He's a little rolly boy right now. What we want to do is uh, stop this actually and hop into the prefab. So you can hit this little arrow here to go inside the prefab. And what I'm going to do is come over to the rigid body 2D and on the constraints, I'm gonna press this little drop down. We're gonna freeze rotation on Z. That way he doesn't roll around, okay? I'm gonna save it, come back over to the scene and press play. Right, left and right, A and D. Okay, A and D. So if we go back in here, let's just, uh, let's crank up the speed a little bit. Let's say it's uh, four and negative four. And let's add a new FSM. Okay, we're gonna add a new FSM, call it jump. And hit edit. And here, we'll have an init, send down to the new state. We'll call this falling. And we're gonna make a new state down here called is grounded. And then another state called jump. Now the reason we want falling to be our first state is because we'll be able to, we want to be able to place our character wherever, wherever we want and then just let him sort of fall into the scene. And then he should be able to find out whether or not he's actually touching the ground. Okay, so let's start with falling. This will have a 2D raycast. Okay, so this action here, raycast 2D. 
And we're going to zoom in on our little guy here. Let's give some room like this. Gizmos, I'm going to shrink some of these gizmos down a little bit. And we want the ray cast to be in the negative y direction. So it'll be negative one. And the distance, we'll say it's one. Okay, so it'll be shooting one unit down from the center of our player here. Okay, and then down here in the layer mask, this is gonna be making sure that the ray cast is only checking for things on a specific layer. So we're gonna press one here. So it's one element that we can add. So it's only choosing one layer. And the layer that we're gonna use is we're gonna add a layer. Okay, and up here in the project, we're gonna add a new layer called ground. Okay, so if we select our player again, come back over here, we should be able to find the new ground layer. Okay, so you can see it says pick only from these layers. That means anything else that that ray cast is shooting down below to, if it's on the default layer or literally anything else other than ground, UI, water, ignore ray cast, transparent, anything, it won't detect it. So it's only detecting things on the ground layer. And that way we could shoot a little ray cast that goes down to right about here. And if there's ground detected, then it'll recognize our player as on the ground. But if there's not any ground detected, then it'll recognize our player as still falling. And that way we could do some programming for those states accordingly. So I'm gonna check this little debug box. That way we could see it in real time when we're running the game because we're probably gonna have to adjust this distance a little bit. But what we wanna do with that information is get this store did hit, okay? So we're gonna add a new variable and we're gonna call it is grounded, right? Because if it hits something and it's true, that means that he should be grounded. And we're gonna do a bool test down here. It's gonna be checking is grounded. It's gonna be running every frame. And if it's true, we'll add a new event called true. And if not, then we're just gonna let him keep falling here in this falling state. Okay, so true, we'll go down here. All right, so let's just make sure some of this is working. Let's go back to the scene, select our ground here, make sure it's set on the ground layer. Save this, select our player, go to the jump FSM, and let's just zoom out a little bit, raise him up, and we're just gonna keep an eye on these states. It should stay in falling until he hits the ground, in which case it hits is grounded. So I'm gonna press play. Falling, grounded, okay. That looks good to me. So that means we can hop back inside the prefab and continue working on this. Okay, so now that, now that we know that this programming is working, we can actually separate some of this logic. So I'm gonna just select this state and I'm gonna copy state. Then I'm gonna come over here and add a component. We're gonna add a new FSM and we're gonna name this FSM is grounded. So there will be a totally separate FSM that's always checking for this logic. We're gonna hit edit, come in here and I'm just gonna go ahead and paste the state. Okay, now, instead of putting a bull test in here, I'm just gonna delete that, and I'm gonna delete this transition, right click and say set a start state, delete this little leftover state. Okay, so we only have one state here, and it's just constantly checking if he's falling or not. So the store did hit. As long as it's hitting, it's gonna be true. If it's not hitting anything, it'll be false. And that's all this FSM is checking. That way, over here on our jump state, what we could do is get rid of this raycast 2D, and instead just put in a get FSM bool, okay? And what we wanna do is get from our is grounded, the variable is grounded, and store it locally here as is grounded. This will be checking every frame, and then it'll be using this bool test as it did before to do the same thing. So we could take both of these actions, copy them, come over here to is grounded, paste it in, except in this state, we don't have anything happen if it's true. Let's change that to none. If it's false, make a new event called false, and that will send back, okay? Now, while we're here in grounded, what we should be able to do is jump, okay? So we can get to this state. So in is grounded, we'll go ahead and use a get key down. And we'll use, of course, spacebar, right? Space. You could use something else, like uh, I'm gonna copy this and change it to the up arrow. Okay, so up arrow or space whatever you want, W even, they'll send a new event, next. And same thing with this one, next. And it'll send over here to the jump state. Okay, now in the jump state, add force 2D. Okay, and it's gonna be sending it to our owner. The force mode, we're gonna change to impulse, and we're gonna be adding it to the Y axis. 
Okay, we'll just make a new variable for this. We'll call it jump height. Okay, and let's make this an input so we could change it over here as we're testing things out. And for now, let's say it's something like 10. That might be kind of crazy, we'll, we'll see. We'll adjust it accordingly. Okay, so it, it only adds that force once. We might have to add it for a little longer, but the impulse should happen one time, and then after we jump, we can add a finished transition here that sends over to falling. Because by the time we jump, we're already falling. Okay, so we could send that up here. All right, so let's see if we need to make any adjustments with that. Let's go back to our scene, select this, make sure we're looking at the jump FSM, let's hit play. Okay, falling and grounded. Now I'm gonna go ahead and hit the up arrow, jumps, grounded, jumps. But see, I can only jump when I'm grounded because if I try jumping before then, nothing happens. I'm hitting the jump key. When I'm in the air, nothing happens. If we didn't wait for grounded, our character would just be able to jump infinitely up, okay? So you can also see that when we're jumping, this little ray cast here is shooting out just below the character a little bit. So what I want to do is adjust that so it doesn't shoot out so much. We want it to only barely check below the character. If we go to our is grounded FSM, we could change the distance to something like 0.5 and make him jump. Now see, he might not recognize that he's, if we go over to jump, oh, it does say he's grounded. Okay, so it does recognize even at 0.5. Great, I think just to be safe, I'm going to go ahead and change it to 0.6. So it sticks out a little bit. So hopefully we see that when he jumps. Yeah, it sticks out a tiny bit below him now. Cool. So now you could jump around like that. Yeah, he's he's really going down there now. Okay. So, okay, so we want to make some adjustments because right now He's a little, he's a little slippery and slidey. Okay, so we press this, he kind of just slides around like that, right? I just, I, I'm barely tapping it and he just, he goes for so long. So what we could do is come over to the prefab and hop inside move. On idle, what we could do is set velocity to D right here up the top. We could just set it once here. Now we don't want it to use the vector because if it sets this Y to zero, that means it'll just snap him to the ground even if he's in the mid, even if he's in mid jump. It'll just stop his jump even if he's mid-jump. So we're gonna change this to none. We don't want it to have any effect on the Y value. But on X, we will. We'll change it, change it to zero. Okay, and it only needs to happen once. We don't need to run that every frame. So let's see what this feels like when we press play now. Okay, snappier, have more control. Oh, and I forgot that we made that change to the raycast while we were running the game. So any changes made during runtime, they don't stay. So you can see that his raycast is still shooting out a lot further. But I remember that if we go back to our prefab and go over to our is grounded, I was setting it to 0.6 and that's what I found a good number. So, so one thing that you might be noticing here if you're using the controller at this point is that it doesn't seem terribly responsive if you're going back and forth a lot. So this is a good lesson to keep in mind concerning the types of input options you have available to you. So let's go to the prefab and inside of our move FSM in the idle state, this is where the problem is. So we're using get key down. Get key down is looking for only the moment in which the key actually goes down. So if we can imagine you have a button here, okay? This is when it's raised. Now, the button is currently up, okay? It's let go. It is not down. Okay, so this is up when it's up here, and this is down when it's squished down here, when you've pushed it down here. Okay, so this is down. But also, the moment you press it from up to down, that in itself, this pushing action is also seen as an entirely separate thing from the state of being up, the state of being down, and the action of going down. And when you release the button, the action of going up. Okay, so there's sort of four different things that input's looking for. The current state of it, right, whether it is up or down, 
So if you're holding it down, then it's down. If you're if you're not touching it at all, then it's up. That's the state, right? And then these two, but the actions of it, right? When you actually press it down, the moment you press it down, the action of pressing it down, and then the action of letting it go when it goes up, when you let the key go up, those are the actions. Those are what we see here for the get key up and get key down. These are the actions of it. These aren't looking for the current state of being up and being down. So the get key is about getting the state. You can see it says gets the pressed state of a key, whether it's up or down at that moment. With the get key, what it's looking for is merely whether or not it's currently down. So if you're pressing and holding a button, it will return the value that it's being pressed down. And if you've let go of a key and it's just up, it'll be constantly showing up. That means that when we first press a key down, the action of it, the verb of pressing it down, it does send over here or over here, that's correct. But if we let go of that key that we just pressed, and while we're here, we're also pressing the other direction, that means that by the time we come to this state, we've already pressed the other key. And this state was the only opportunity that the FSM had to check for that. And so it doesn't do anything, it just stays here. So we might actually be holding the key, and at one point we did press the key down to go over to right, for example. But since we were in left when we pressed the right key, the idle state never got its chance to check for that. So instead of using get key down, we just have to change this to get key. Okay, so we're gonna replace left arrow, right arrow, A and D. So I'm gonna select all these, and we're just gonna put in get key. Okay, so we'll do left arrow, and we're gonna store the result as a new variable called left underscore is down. And that's running every frame. And I'm gonna copy and paste this, and we're gonna say right arrow, and this will be a new variable called right underscore is down. And then paste a new one, same thing, it's gonna be A this time. And this we could use the same bool value. So A is left, right? So left is down. And we'll do D. And this one is right, right? So these can use the same bool value. So we're using the get key actions now. And in this one, we could use bool tests, two of them. Okay, we'll move both of them to the bottom. Okay, so that's happening at the end here. These are also running every frame. And one is checking for left is down, and the other is checking for right is down. So if left is down is true, then we can go left. And if right is down is true, then we can go right, okay? So now if we go back and play this, and I select our player, go to the move state just so we could see it running, okay? We can move left and right. And now I can do the thing where if while I'm moving right, I could hold left and then let go of right. So I could be holding the next key I want to be pressing, and it immediately responds to it once I let go of the key I'm currently pressing. And now we just have a much snappier character controller, okay? And you know what, this jump is like way out of control. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop this, and we're gonna hop over here into the jump FSM and variable for jump height. We're gonna change that to something like three, okay? Let's just let's just feel the, the character controller. A really important thing about designing a character controller is getting the feel of what you want. Okay, so this might be too small of a jump, right? But it's really important that you feel out how you want your character controller to behave. So I'm gonna go ahead and change it to maybe like five. Honestly, maybe even six. Let's see how that works. Okay, maybe a little too high. Forgot that the jump height is an input, so we could change it from here, change it to five. Okay, that's a little bit better. So here's a little ancient video game design secret, which is that the character controller for a lot of games, for a lot of both 2D and 3D, has an artificial increase on the gravity. Um, so right now, 
you'll see that we jump and we come back down. And this is sort of a realistic, a quote unquote realistic simulation of how that object might fall with whatever the mass and drag and all that stuff is based off of, we come over here to project settings, go to physics and it's gravity right here is negative 9.81. And that default is based off of some calculation for whatever the Earth's gravity is. I, I forget exactly what the details on the origin of this number is. But what we need to know is that in video games, it's not really about how realistic something is so much as it is about how good it feels to play. So what we're going to do is hop into the prefab and go over to our jump. And when we're falling, what we're going to do is do an artificial increase on the gravity. So we're going to type in gravity here and we're going to use this set gravity 2d scale so if i pop it in here you read the little description here it says sets the degree to which the object is affected by gravity so the gravity scale let's go ahead and when it's grounded put the scale in here as well and we'll just leave it at one but when it's falling let's change it to something like five okay and because the gravity's increased, we even want the jump to be higher. So honestly, maybe our jump height is gonna be something better like 10, or let's try eight for now. Okay, so gravity scale when we're falling is gonna be increased to five. We can even come over here and add a new variable called fall gravity and right click it, edit variable, make it an input so we can test it over here too. So let's say it's five. Okay, and let's play with this until we get something that feels right. I'm just gonna go ahead and collapse these. Okay. Okay, there we go. That already feels so much better. Falls a lot faster. Okay. But the jump height isn't as good. We want him to jump a little higher probably. So the jump height will change to 10. Let's see if that feels better. Honestly, could even probably change it to 15. Nope, let's try 12. Yeah, maybe even change the gravity to six. Okay, I think that feels nice. Okay, so six and 12. Fall gravity is six and jump height is 12. Let's go inside the prefab, select it, six and 12. So the next thing I wanna set up is the animations. What we're gonna do for this is add a component. We're gonna come in and add an animator. Okay, and the animator controller, by the way, is very different from the animation component, right? Animator, animation, we want the animator, okay? The animator component needs a animator controller. So I'm gonna come over to our project, and in here I'm gonna right click, create animator controller. And I'm just gonna call this our 2D animator controller. I'm gonna select our player game object and drag and drop this animator controller right here. Okay, so if I double click on this, it opens up a new tab, a new window where we can see our animator controller. I'm gonna zoom out because you can see this exit right here. Okay, I'm gonna put it up here, kind of clean things up. So this is gonna be responsible for which animations are playing on our character. In order to put animations in here, we need to make animation clips first. So I'm gonna go ahead and select our player sprite, hit control six, brings up the animation window, and I'm gonna hit create clip, okay? And it's asking me where I wanna save this. I'll go ahead and just save this in our 2D platformer right now, that's fine. So I'm gonna call this our walk animation and hit save. So you can see that it got saved over here. It's this little blue triangle with the lines behind it. That's an animation clip, right? That's the type of file it is. So with this animation clip, uh, what I'm gonna do is come over to our character folder with the with all the PNGs that we saw earlier right and I'm gonna select the walking one so I think let me see what is it we have walk one and two so there's only really two frames here so it is these two animation window open I'm gonna select the player sprite here okay with it selected I can now take the first frame of this walk animation drop it in and the second frame and drop it in and I'll drop it in and then I can come over here to the one, which is one second, and add a keyframe. So if I press play, one, two, three, you can see this is one second long, right? Now, when I add a keyframe over here, that's just saying that 
So these two frames, they're the same thing. I'm just saying that this is the last one before it should loop back to this first keyframe. So I move this out of the way, and as long as I'm in scene view with my little player selected, you can see that between this frame and this frame, we have a little walk animation. I can hit play. Okay, that's a little slow, so I'm gonna go ahead and select all my frames, and then I can take this little ex take this little double-sided arrow and squish it down to say make it last half the amount of time. Uh, let's see, play that. I can maybe go a little faster. Okay, that looks good to me. So then in the animator, walk's already in here, okay? If your walk isn't in here, what you could do is just drag and drop the walk animation. You can see that it, it adds it like that, okay? So if I delete this right now, and if I drag and drop this walk in here, you'll see that it makes it orange. But if I drag and drop it in again, it makes it gray. And that's because it needs a first animation to go to by default. So I'm gonna go ahead and delete both of these because what I want is the first state to be idle, actually. With our player sprite selected, I'm gonna go ahead and create a new clip. We'll call it idle. And then I'll grab the idle image, make sure our player is selected, and drag and drop that in there. Okay, so it's just one frame. And that's what we want to be our first animation. So entry goes to idle and it just stays there. Now I'm going to select this little drop down and go create new clip because we also want a jump animation. And if I shrink these down to see the numbers and the names, there's only one frame for jump. Okay, that's cool. So we can take this jump and drag it in like this. So it's only the one frame as well. Okay, so we have idle, we have jump, and if we go back to this folder here, we have idle, jump, and walk. So I could drag walk in here as well. Put it like this. Cool, so I'm just gonna close this. Now we need to remember how these are all spelled. So the name of the clip that we created is idle, jump, and walk, and it's spelled this way. They're all lowercase, right? And by default, when we make the clip and just drag it in, it'll name these states in the animator the same thing. However, that doesn't mean they have to be named the same thing. So if I select this walk state, you can see that it's using the walk file. When I click it, it highlights the file over here, right? See, like that. Uh, but we could name it to whatever we want. So you can see that this state is now named but it's using the walk animation. I wanna keep it as walk, but it's just good to keep that in mind, okay? So we have idle, walk, and jump. And now with our player sprite selected, go over to Playmaker, and I'm going to select idle here, and we're going to use the animator play. So in idle, I'm just gonna type in idle here for the state name. In left, we're gonna type in walk, and I'm gonna copy this and paste it in here. Okay, so it always plays walk. And then in jump, under falling, we're gonna put animator play. It's gonna have the jump animation, okay? We're also gonna put that in jump so it starts right when we jump. And then in grounded, we're gonna have an animator play. And the state name is gonna be a variable that we'll call grounded animation. And we're gonna use a get FSM string. We're gonna put it right above the animator play. Because what we want to do is go over to our move FSM and in left and right, what we're going to do is put a set string value, okay? And the string value we're going to be setting is move animation. For left, we're going to just set it to walk, okay? Make sure that you don't press enter, otherwise it puts an indentation, and that's different from just walk without an indentation. So I'm gonna copy that, and also put it in here. Okay, so it's the same value as this. You can even just copy and paste it like that. Okay, and then in idle, put it up here. And this will be idle, like that. That way, in our jump FSM, when we're in is grounded after we're done falling, it's gonna get from move the move animation and store it in our grounded animation and use it here. 
when it's grounded, we know to either keep playing some type of run animation or an idle animation. So, okay, so let's see how this works out. Moving left and right, we can jump, jump. Okay, so he has a little jump animation. So of course, when we move to the right, he works out, but when we move to the left, it looks like he's just moonwalking and he's walking backwards. So what we need to do is open up this prefab and come over to our move FSM. And in left, we're gonna do is set sprite flip. When he's facing left, he's facing in the negative direction. So we're gonna go ahead and flip him. Okay, and we're flipping him on the X axis. So right now you can see he's facing to the right. So when we flip him on the X axis, that means he'll be facing to the left. Now we're gonna copy this action and paste it in the right state and uncheck it. The sprite gets set back to face the right when he's facing the right direction. Okay, so let's give this a little test spin. There we go, moves left, moves right. You can jump both to the left and to the right. So the next thing we wanna set up is go to our items in here. We're gonna make it so we could pick up little items. So let's say there's these blue jewels. Okay, we're gonna change this to Sprite 2D and UI. Hit apply and drag it into the scene like this. Okay, and if I select it, hit F on top of it. Okay, let's zoom out a little bit and let's let's rename some of these items that are seen. So first of all, this, I'm gonna rename it to ground and then this, I'm gonna rename it to jewel. Now in my 2D platformer folder, I'm gonna drag and drop this jewel in here like that. Okay, I wanna make it a prefab. Okay, and I'm gonna put it like right here and I'll duplicate it a few times like this. Okay, like that. And then we could double click on the prefab here. Okay, so we're gonna take this jewel and we're gonna give it add component, let's say a box collider 2D. Okay, and we're gonna hit this little edit button so we can scale this collider box to fit a little bit better. Okay, looks good. And then we wanna check it as is trigger. Okay, we're gonna add a component. It's gonna add an FSM and we'll call this FSM jewel to edit. And in here, we're gonna have a trigger 2D event. Now this trigger 2D event is gonna be checking if anything enters this collision box. When anything enters this collision box, it'll trigger an event. So it'll only be looking for things with this tag that we could specify. So we could specify player tag. So that means only when the player enters this little square. And that's when it'll send the event. Next. Okay, we'll add that transition, sends off to the next state, and we'll call this first state waiting to be grabbed. And this one is add points. Okay, so in add points, just for testing purposes right now, let's just say we're gonna add a destroy self, and so that's just gonna destroy the jewel. All right, so we can go over this, and you can see that we are grabbing these jewels. Grab that one, that one, and that one. Okay, so far so good. Now that the jewels can get picked up, we could do something simple in here. So on the add points, just before it destroys itself, you could do something like a send event right here. And we'll do a broadcast all, and we'll make a new global event called points add. And that way, whenever the player picks up a jewel, out here, we can make a UI text and under this canvas, if we just stretch this out a little bit, focus in on the canvas. We have our text element here, and I'm gonna click on this Rec Transform middle and center button, and holding Alt and Shift, I'm just gonna click the middle right here, so that centers it out. Then I'm gonna come down and make sure that the alignment is also centered. Okay, that's just to center up the text like that. And this will be our points, so we can type in points here, or, you know, whatever, 10 points as like a placeholder or something. I'm also gonna change the color of this. So let's just change it to white so we could see it a little bit better. And we'll just add a panel, UI panel. We'll put it 
in here and I'm just gonna drag the text as a child of the panel. Okay, and we'll make the panel a little darker. This is just cosmetic, just so we could see what we're doing a little bit better. And on the panel, I'm gonna right click and add an FSM and we'll call this points. And in here, I'm just gonna right click, add global transition, custom events, points, add. Okay, so in here, what you could do is do an int add and we'll make a new variable called points and we'll add, let's say, 10 points for every jewel you pick up. Okay, but we actually don't want this in the start state, so I'm gonna drag and drop this into the points add state. Okay, we'll call this add points. And this one is just, it yeah, doesn't need to be anything. And then you could do a UI text set text, and it's gonna be our text game object here, because that's the text game object that actually has the text component. And it's gonna set it with a variable that we have. This is our points, but we're gonna convert that int into a string because the UI text set text needs a string variable. But thankfully, uh, Playmaker has this little nifty convert feature. Okay, so we're gonna be converting that int into text that will display on our text. Okay, so actually we should put zero here to begin with. Let's actually just make sure that this panel isn't too big. We want it to be kind of small. Let's just squish it in like this and we'll put it up here at the top. Make our text a little bit bigger. That 26, does that fit? We'll stretch this up, make it fit the box a little bit better. And just squeeze this over to the side. Cool, let's give it a play. Right, so we can run around, jump, okay. And I'm gonna grab the first one and you see that we've added 10 points. Next one, 20, 30, 40, and 60. Okay, so those are some of the basics of making a 2D platformer, your character controller, the level for your character to run around in, and some items for your character to pick up. Be sure to check out our other videos to learn all the various features of Playmaker. Links to more learning resources are in the description.